I began to notice things in my behavior, and I began to notice things were slipping, and I began to notice my patience was running thin uh, with people I kind of loved and cared about. Tonight, a story you'll see only on the Dollar Report. Leonard Marshall, one of the top defensive linemen of his era, reduced to tears as he fights a debilitating disease. The NFL reneging on his settlement money, and race could be the reason. Vladimir Putin flexing his military muscle again, a naval parade, a fresh threat, and news about his new doomsday plane. If you're not sure what that is, it's just what it sounds like. And as St. Louis makes masks a requirement for everyone indoors, again, we're joined by a frustrated gym owner who says he may lose his business this time around. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening, great to have you with us. We start here tonight with an exclusive report on the most watched sport in America, football and the NFL. Millions build their Sundays around the slate of games each week, followed by a season-ending game, the Super Bowl, which is traditionally one of the most watched events on television. But tonight, in a report you'll see only here, we focus on the fallout from many of the players who sacrifice not only their bodies, but their brains to play a game they love. The effect of repeated head trauma is showing up in the brains of former players in the form of, among other things, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, something that is typically only diagnosed in an autopsy. Well, a recent study found signs of CTE in 110 of 111 deceased players whose brains were studied. At issue tonight is a massive $1 billion settlement, payments the NFL agreed to make to players who suffer from dementia, Alzheimer's, and other cognitive problems. This story, though, focuses more on the players who didn't get a settlement based on a number of factors, they argue, including race. Investigative reporter Rich McHugh has spent six months digging into this story, the players and the doctors. And tonight, he starts with the players who say they are now caught in a legal showdown that's not only unfair, it's unjust. Uh, pro football shaped my life. I had accomplished everything that I thought that I could accomplish. He's third in all-time sacks for the New York Giants, a two-time Super Bowl champion, three-time Pro Bowler, and twice voted the NFL's Defensive Lineman of the Year. Safe to say Leonard Marshall earned his spot among NFL royalty. He retired from the game at age 33. Ten years later, Marshall says something was off. Yeah, I began to notice things with my behavior. I began to notice things were slipping, and I began to notice my patience was running thin. Uh, with people I loved and cared about. I didn't quite understand it. I came home and he said I had an episode and I called the local authorities and I felt I wanted to kill myself. Leonard's wife, Lisa. He couldn't express it. He just felt it. That he felt like his world was crumbling and I couldn't understand why because it came out of the blue. In 2013, he volunteered to have his brain studied by a team at UCLA using PET scans to look for evidence of CTE, a progressive degenerative brain disease found in people with a history of repeated head trauma. They concluded that Marshall did in fact have CTE. Was there any warning that this might be a bad thing for your mental health or your brain or anything like that? Back in my era of football, we didn't talk about concussions. There was no warning whatsoever. I mean, I knew when I signed up to play in the National Football League that I would get beaten, battered, and bruised. But what I didn't know was that traumatic brain injury would become so prevalent. But the NFL was aware at least as early as 1994, the year Marshall retired. It was then that NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabu created the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee. Asked about it publicly at the time, he dismissed the problem, calling concussions, quote, one of these packed journalism issues, and said that the number of concussions is, quote, relatively small. I've played 13 years and I've suffered many injuries. Today, Marshall is one of over 20,000 former NFL players who have registered in the NFL concussion center. Settlement. I am also one of the players who's fighting for equitable treatment. Those diagnosed with ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia are eligible to receive a monetary award. CTE, however, was excluded from the settlement. Leonard had started with the process of confirming that he had CTE through UCLA. Marshall's attorney, Jason Lukasevic, filed the first cases against the NFL and originated the NFL concussion litigation. He had seen some other doctors prior to the settlement becoming effective. 
who said, look, he, he has many neurodegenerative issues. Diagnosed with dementia and Parkinson's disease, Marshall filed a claim with the NFL concussion settlement. In 2017, his claim for Parkinson's disease was approved, entitling him to a monetary award of $1.9 million. But months later, the NFL claims administrator reviewed his claim and reversed the award, stating that his Parkinson's diagnosis was not generally consistent with the settlement criteria because his condition was, quote, stable, not characteristic of the progressive decline of Parkinson's, and also because alternative Alternative explanations are likely, namely CTE. Just like that. And that I had to see another set of doctors. And I'm like, what kind of game is this? You're approved. Actually, hang on. You're not approved. We challenged this and you got to go through the whole testing all over again. Correct. And in the process of seeing those doctors, his neuropsychological tests somehow improve. But the reasoning and rationale that they did is because they applied race-based normative data to Leonard. The settlement agreement negotiated by the NFL required the neuropsychologist to apply the race-based norms, which is to say they adjusted Marshall's results because he is black. His examination results state it very clearly. All scores below are demographically adjusted based on Mr. Marshall's age, education, gender, and race. The NFL in June said they would end the controversial practice referred to as race norming, a practice that made it harder for black retirees to show a deficit and qualify for an award. The claims administrator would not comment on Marshall's claim to News Nation. It makes me feel like, well, I don't even want to say the, 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 the explicit word. Uh, I think you'll, you'll get the gist of my drift with that. Um, it hurts. When race is used to differentiate between people of the same group organization, that's a civil rights violation and it needs investigated. I am a victim of race norming. I am a victim of race norming. Race norming is ridiculous. It's got to go. Class counsel Chris Seeger, he's got to go. Chris Seeger, the attorney who negotiated the settlement on behalf of the players, toured the country in 2017 singing its praises. I think it's really, really good. And it accomplishes the goal that we uh, set out to achieve from day one, which was to get help to the players and their families who need it now. Seeger also initially said he saw no evidence of racial bias in the administration of the settlement fund, but recently pivoted and apologized for any pain the program has caused. He also said those with a diagnosis prior to 2017 would be paid. Because if you have a diagnosis, of a neurocognitive or neuromuscular problem before that date, and it was done by a board-certified, legitimate doctor, those diagnoses will be honored in the settlement. But that's not what happened with Marshall. Seeger declined to comment, citing a recent gag order in the case. Because this isn't a settlement. This is a claims process that less than 5% of the former players have only been paid. I truly believe that the Attorney General's Office or the Department of Justice needs to look at what's going on here. In the seven years since the settlement was created, NFL were 20,558 registered class members, just over 3,200 claim packages received, less than 1,300 players have been paid. And yet, the attorney who negotiated the settlement, Chris Seeger, has been awarded at least $64 million by the judge presiding over this case. Why is there unfairness to these former players? It's obvious it's a broken system. Why is everybody getting paid but these former players? It's obvious that something has failed here. And Rich McHugh joins us right now. Rich, I'm sure people watching this will say these are conditions diagnosed by an expert, in some cases, most if not all, approved by the NFL. How can they reverse that and not follow through on these claims? Well, that's precisely what these former players are saying themselves. They're saying, look, you guys created these, these rules, these, this, this criteria. You said if you have a diagnosis from a board-certified uh, neurologist, um, you qualify under the terms of this settlement. And clearly in Leonard's case, that's not happening. And, and in many of the players that I've spoken to, that is simply not happening. And they don't know why. They, they don't know why they're being denied. So the NFL has also agreed to change this process that you mentioned, uh, that basically changes the baseline mm -hmm. of uh, neurological, I guess, status based on race. Now that they've agreed that they're going to change this process, does that mean these players will qualify again for these rewards that in some cases they were supposed to get? That remains to be seen, but uh, the players that I've spoken to and, and uh, they say nothing has changed in their cases, they say the right thing uh, that should happen is if they had a diagnosis, just pay those players. Mm -hmm. Like, agree to what you said you were going to do instead of fighting them tooth and nail on it.
All right, so uh, I, I want to ask you more about CTE and why it's not included in this, but we have another couple nights with more reports from yep. you. Let's talk about what we see tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to speak to two doctors. I, uh, I spoke to a number of doctors in my reporting, but two doctors agreed to go on the record, and they, they were hired by the NFL to treat these players, to diagnose these players. Mm -hmm. And one was fired and one left uh, because of uh, the whole experience. They, they approved them for settlement for the monies, and their claims were all denied. And they said, you know, the NFL doesn't want our opinion. Uh, all right, we'll see you with more on that tomorrow. Rich McHugh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank we you. appreciate it. We're going to hear now from Leonard Marshall himself, kind enough to join us. Uh, Leonard, let's start with a personal question. How are you doing right now? How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good tonight. When did you notice things starting to change for you? You touched on it in Rich's story there. And how did you know things were changing? You were a professional athlete. You knew your body. Well, around 2007, 2008, I started having some changes in my behavior. And I started to notice some things that, that just weren't consistent with who Leonard Marshall really was. And this is 11, 12 years after my daughter was born. And, you know, one of the greatest loves in your life, if you ever get a chance to become a father, or if you are a father, is to, to, to watch, you know, the, the, mas the maturation of your mm -hmm. child. And my child would watch me, man, and it was just like, you know, extremely difficult for me to explain, you know, what I was going through to my 11, 12-year-old daughter and why sometimes daddy wasn't the kindest person in the world mm -hmm. and, and, and why things just seemed to be, you know, insignificant at times to daddy when in fact there should have been great moments in time because, you know, the time you get to spend with your daughter, there's no, there's no other love greater than the love between a father and a daughter. And every little girl that doesn't grow up with a dad, I, I, I feel for them because, uh, you know, I, I had the greatest bond with my child uh, when she was young. You know, uh, I lost that due to my decline in, uh, declination in health. Right. So you were diagnosed with a number of things that you thought were going to qualify you for a settlement. In fact, you were granted a $1.9 million settlement. But then, as I understand it, the NFL pulled it back and said you were not going to get it. What did they tell you about why it was reversed? Well, they, 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 that's just it. They didn't tell me anything. I mean, uh, you know, for the most part, they just said that uh, they didn't think my case was as severe. Um, and I, I, I believe it was due to some of the stuff that's come out of late. Um, I've had several arguments and discussions with folks about this. Um, I've had arguments and discussions with other clinicians. Uh, I've seen over uh, uh, 10 doctors for this. Uh, I've seen at least four additional doctors after being approved and, and, mm -hmm. and somewhat awarded money. And um, I just don't understand it. You know, I, I mean, at this point, I'm... Like I explained to Rich, I'm baffled by it. Uh, I think the 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 bias that's been shown to uh, uh, many a player. I mean, do you think this was guys bias? Have Leonard, compensation. Do, you, do you think this was biased? I, 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 you know, I, I you know, I, it's tough for me to put my hand on it. To be honest with you, I mean, I, it's tough for me to put my hand on it. I, I think um, uh, for the most part, uh, many of players have been ostracized because of this. Uh, some players have lost relationships with friends because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and former teammates because they choose to distance themselves uh, because I've been uh, a guy who's been outspoken. And then there's others that, that say, man, I, I feel for you because, you know, you, you're in that position. And I know what you meant to me in the huddle. Mm -hmm. I know what you meant to our team. I know you, what you meant to our championship teams. And it breaks my heart that you're actually having to deal with this at this point in time in your life. Do you think you'll get the settlement, Leonard, in the end? Uh, um, I, I hope and pray that it, that, that it happens for my family while I'm alive. Um, I, I hope that, you know, like I said to Rich, you know, I, I don't have a chance to go back out on the field and, and, and do the things I did and, and, and make the money I made while playing football. All I have now is a legacy. So what I did as a player made me a hero. What I need now shows those people that think of me as a hero that I'm human. Leonard, you say while you're alive right now, you're not very old. Um, are you worried about dying young? Um, you know, I'm not gonna say dying young. I will say that, you know, I watched the declination of, of John Mackey. 
I mean, I met John Mackey in his late 50s in Delray Beach, Florida, at the time I lived in Boca Raton. And for several years in watching John Mackey, every year I watched John from, from about, I'm going to say 58, 59 to about 67, 68 years old mm -hmm. of his life, okay, all I watched was a man who declined and declined and declined. And it didn't get any better for him. And I'm quite sure it was tough, tough, tough as hell mm -hmm. on his wife, who happens to be a wonderful woman right. and a wonderful person. Uh, and and that's the stuff that scares the hell out of me. Right. And I know you've talked about the importance of your wife, Lisa, in this journey as well. NFL great Leonard Marshall, thank yes. you so much for your time. We appreciate it very much, and we wish you the best of health. Gentlemen, thank you so much for bringing light to this subject matter. All right. Russia unveiled its ballistic missile-wielding nuclear sub at a weekend naval parade for the first time, but that didn't stop Vladimir Putin from ordering news of new doomsday planes. That's right, doomsday planes to control his forces from the skies in the event of nuclear war. More muscle flexing from Putin coming up. And the tough talk between the United States and China heats up. Leland Vittert next on what might come of this war of words between two superpowers. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. A top Chinese diplomat accused the U.S. of inventing an imaginary enemy during tense meetings between representatives from Beijing and the Biden administration. China's vice foreign minister says the relationship between the U.S. and China faced serious difficulties after the U.S. criticized China's crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong, as well as ongoing human rights abuses in China and Tibet. The latest in a string of flare-ups between the two nations dating back to January and comes nearly a week after the U.S. and its allies accused China of a global hacking campaign. Joining us now to talk about where things go from here for the two biggest economies in the world, News Nation's Leland Vittert. And I guess we really shouldn't be surprised because we've already seen this move right. once in, in uh, Alaska. Well, yeah, we've seen this move by the Chinese for decades. Anytime that they are pushed or forced in any way, the Chinese play the victims. Why? Because they keep getting to do all the bad things they do and the U.S. runs around saying, no, 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 that's not what we really meant. Uh, this is Bloomberg's reporting. The American diplomat was presented with a list of demands portrayed as necessary to stabilize the ties, including, quoting now, U.S. wrongdoings must stop, yeah. which begs the question, what possibly is the U.S. doing wrong here? Well, especially when you start ticking off all of the things right. that we have issues with China on, from, as we mentioned, Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, you've got the COVID, the coronavirus. Right. I mean, the, 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 covering up, covering Taiwan. up the COVID, Taiwan, takeover of the South China Sea, intellectual property theft, hacking. Hacking, right. We did a story about this on Friday, uh, Kidnap, trying to kidnap American citizens and force them to go back to China to face uh, trumped up charges there. The list goes on and on of the Chinese wrongdoing. They don't want to talk about any of that. So what do they do? They make counter accusations. So what's changed uh, since January? Because the, the big sticking point with President Trump was trade, obviously. And President Biden has brought in and has come in and kept many of the policies that yes. President Trump uh, had with China. While I think trying, it seems anyway, to, to gather more allies to join in pushing back against well, China. If you want to push the Chinese anywhere, you have to do it collectively as a group of as a group, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to get Australia on board. You have to get India on board. There's a number of countries here that have to collectively come together and be willing to pressure the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Whether or not President Biden can get that done or not is to be determined. But it is the only way to get the Chinese to even think about changing their behavior. Does anything change in the short term, I guess, is the question. Do we continue to have these meetings that we can assume will end like these have so far? Well, in a way, it sort of shows progress in a way that they are ending this way because it's like any, any bully, any child, anybody who's been allowed to run rampant on the playground. Mm. If you tell them to stop for a while, they're going to keep going, no, 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 I must continue to run rampant. It's my right to run rampant and do all these things until there is pain such that they no longer are willing to accept the pain for their mm -hmm. bad behavior. All right, well, we will see. Incentives, I believe, is what they're called on the world stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 ex exactly. Yeah, we'll see. Leland, thanks very much. His show on balance here is right after our program on News Nation 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Stay tuned for that right after us at the top of the hour. Pivoting now to another foreign adversary, Russia's Vladimir Putin at a weekend parade marking the 325th anniversary of Russia's Navy. President Putin declared Russia has everything it needs to defend the homeland, saying we are capable 
of detecting any underwater, above water, airborne enemy, and if required, carry out an unpreventable strike against it. The Russian naval parade included more than 50 ships, including battleships as well as the naval air fleet. Putin also unveiled Russia's nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine for the first time. Battleships from Iran were also featured. President Putin has also reportedly agreed to purchase two new so-called doomsday planes, which would allow him to maintain control of Russian forces from the air in the event of nuclear war. For more perspective on this, I want to welcome in former U.S. diplomat and the Russia strategy director at the U.S. Institute of Peace, Don Jensen. Don, it's good to see you again. I know you're with the U.S. Institute of Peace. Does any of this concern you, or should it? <laughs> it concerns us a great deal. Nice to be on again. Our, our concern is resolving and helping peace, not. Uh, but this is certainly worrisome. And, and once again, Putin is strutting around. He's got an election coming up. We are the main enemy for the Russians. In many ways, they see themselves at war with us, and uh, he's going to talk. And, and he did a lot of that over the weekend, mm -hmm. and you see the result. A lot of bravado, a lot of str strutting around. But that doesn't mean there's not a lot to be concerned about here, and I think that's worth pondering. Sure. Well, he said Russia uh, can launch an unpreventable strike if needed. What do you think he means by that? Well, I think uh, he's claiming what Russia can do, has done for a long time, which is have the nuclear capability to, to attack the United States. Now, we would retaliate, of course, but Russia since uh, 2007 and 8 has been in a very aggressive military reform buildup. And this, this is very troubling. They've used their power in Ukraine. They're militarizing the Black Sea, as you probably know, mm -hmm. and they're developing new weapon systems. And these systems right. are, are not just conventional nuclear stuff. These are hypervelocity weapons. These are the kinds of stuff he bragged about over the weekend. And it's a matter of great concern. What do you make about Russia's push to advance its military, Don? Uh, you know, he's also also done a lot of talking about his new hypersonic missiles, which he says there is no equal for in the world. Uh, a couple of points, sir. Uh, first of all, the arms control architecture as we've known it since the Cold War is breaking down because of weapons like hypervelocity weapons, which are tremendously destructive, like nuclear weapons, only they're not nuclear and they're not regulated. So to some extent, we don't even know where they would be, be coming from. But mm -hmm. Russia sees the U.S. as making it, Russia, a victim in the world. They want to upturn the international system with their part partners the Chinese, which is doing it in a different kind of way. Right. And Putin sees the ability to surprise, the ability to attack us with disinformation, cyber attacks. These are all ways where a weaker Russia can play its to its strengths, and it uses the openness of Western societies to its advantage because they can go right in and cause some of the chaos that they've done. What they are out to cause trouble. Right. Well, what about these doomsday planes? Is that just a headline, Don? Do you think? I'll let you get your earpiece back in there. Uh, we have these doomsday planes as well, uh, but these are not things we like to think about. Uh, that we have to think about them. They are not new. What this is is a new version of the kind of system they've had for a long time, going back to the 1980s and 1990s. The, the, the maker is Illusion. It's no doubt highly capable technologically, and it can do exactly what he wants it to do. But this is not new. Uh, perhaps the one new thing we can say is the engines are made by Russia and not bought from the West or from China, which was the case in the past. Oh, but again, this kind of bravado is what Russia is doing to try to intimidate the West. Some of our allies are a little weak need sometimes and to get advantage strategically and play to its strengths. All right. Always great to get your insight. Don Jensen, former U.S. diplomat and Russia strategy director at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Masks are a requirement for everyone indoors. Once again in St. Louis, we're joined by a frustrated gym owner who says he may lose his business this time around. And with back to school just around the corner, will it be back to masks in school this year? I'll speak with a teacher on what effect masks will have on students and what effect COVID has had on those returning students. It's all ahead. News on the COVID front, the Department of Veterans Affairs will require its health care workers to get the coronavirus vaccine within the next two months, becoming the first federal agency to do so. The news comes as nearly 60 major medical groups, including the American Medical Association, call for mandatory vaccinations for health care workers. 
Also, officials in California and New York City say they will require all public employees, including teachers and first responders, to get COVID vaccines or face weekly testing. Mayor Bill de Blasio's announcement gives New York's 340,000 city workers until mid-September to get the shot. The move makes the city one of the largest employers in the country to take such action, and it is the closest thing to a public vaccine mandate that the U.S. has seen so far. And in St. Louis City and County, officials implemented new mask mandates today as cases rise in Missouri over the last month. The seven-day new case average in that state has more than tripled. On June 25th, Missouri reported 891 total new cases. A month later, that number was up to more than 1,500 daily. Joe Goldberg is the owner of True Fusion St. Louis. It's a fitness studio in suburban St. Louis. Joe, what are you doing now? So today the mask mandate went back into place? Yes, and uh, our members were attending classes and full uh, masks. And um, it's quite a, uh, a little bit of a, of a mess, being that some municipalities are enforcing the mandate and some are fighting that. Some studios are uh, following and, and some aren't. Um, but it does feel different this time than it than it did the first time that the mask mandate mandate came out. Different how, Joe? It's different in the fact that um, the mandate is because there's a significant population in our state that aren't being vaccinated, and that uh, the people in our municipality and and our membership um, have an extremely high vaccination rate. We surveyed. Our members uh, just the other day, um, and over 65% of our members replied, and of that, 97% of them are fully vaccinated. Um, so it's a it's a, a frustrating um, feeling to ha feel like we're going backwards uh, when when the group in St. Louis County, uh, for the for the most part, uh, have been have been doing our part, and it's the uh, the counties on the outskirts and and in rural Missouri. Um, that are really causing the problems right. and, and flooding our hospitals as well. You support the vaccine, Joe. I mean, you could essentially, I guess, require a vaccine to get into your gym, but you'd still need to require masks, would you not? What's the answer here? Yes, uh, actually, we, we haven't announced it to our members, uh, but when the mask mandate is uh, removed and uh, there's, there's a number of people fighting uh, the mandate, um, we, we do plan to require our members to um, show their vaccination cards or choose to not. And if they choose not to show their mm -hmm. cards for privacy, um, we will require them to wear masks. Um, I believe in New York, there's more of a, of a official passport. We just have the, the cards that you get with a little uh, handwritten signature. Right. Um, but, uh, but we do feel like, um, you know, I feel like as a business owner, um, thinking for the long term, maintaining the trust and, and comfort of our members um, is an important thing and, and defying the, the mandate um, may be short sighted. I mean, I can tell you um, we've lost over 25 members uh, that have frozen their membership because they um, won't wear a mask when mm -hmm. they come in. Wow. Uh, and before COVID, when we had 2000 members, 20, 25 members isn't that big of a deal. Uh, but post COVID, we're now down to around 800 members. and. Wow. You know, it's um, it's difficult, yeah. especially when not everybody is choosing to follow the rules and people can go elsewhere. Um, and well, it's it's taking money out of our yeah, pocket to pay our people. And you're paying a toll for it for sure. Joe Goldberg, thank you for sharing your story. We appreciate it. Owner of True Fusion in St. Louis. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Business owners aren't the only ones impacted by the pandemic restrictions and mask mandates. Students across the country will have to wear masks when they return to class in the fall in many cases. In a recent op-ed in the LA Times, high school and college civics teacher Jeremy Adams says students may be returning to the classroom, but the classroom is not the same as it was pre-pandemic. It reads in part, nowadays there's little talking, no socializing, no teenage gossiping or flirting. Instead, they silently self-medicate on their devices. Jeremy is also the author of the upcoming book, hollowed out a warning about America's next generation, which is out next month. And Jeremy joins us right now. Jeremy, this was an eye-opening op-ed for me. What, what struck me is it sounds almost like your students ha have lost their spirit to learn. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think one of the things that a lot of people in the broader public probably thought was going to happen was that we were going to you know, open up the schools. And even if the kids were wearing the masks, they were going to be so excited about coming back 
that uh, everything would be the same as it, as it was before. Uh, and I'll be honest, I, I kind of have that expectation as well. Um, goodness knows, nobody wants the classroom to be the same way that it was before as much as I do. And yet what I've experienced is a lot of these kids as they've been gone for mm -hmm. 15, 16 months now, from the everyday hustle and bustle of the classroom, you know, they've spent a year where they could take classes anonymously. Uh, you know, most of my students had their Zoom cameras off. Right. Uh, you know, they could watch Netflix and text one another and watch uh, videos all day. And, you know, they all pretty much admitted that, you know, we, we cheat on our tests, or at least by conventional standards, we, mm. you know, we, we, we didn't actually have to study that much because there's no way to monitor it. And so when these kids came back, Joe, they really didn't know how to behave all that well. Uh, and they, you know, they've spent nine or 10 hours a day on cell phones uh, for a year and a half. And it's, it's tough to get off of that habit. Yeah. How do teachers and, and students and parents, for that matter, Jeremy, recover from this? Well, it, it's going to be difficult. I really sympathize with your previous guest, by the way, uh, because teaching in a mask uh, is is absolutely miserable. Uh, you know, it's really hard. You talk, you ask, you know, how are we going to come back from this? It's really hard to come back when you can't make that human connection to the students that you're used to making. And I'm sorry, facial expressions and making that connection and being able to laugh and smile or be disappointed or all these things. I mean, teaching is a, is the most human of human activities. And when you wear a mask and you're distance and you're frankly, you know, not getting to know the students because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're somewhere else, uh, you know, looking at a pixelated screen all day, it's really hard to return. Um, and, and that's why, frankly, I, I think that, you know, what the public is seeing now is a lot of frustration uh, with people yeah. like me who feel like we need to get back to normal. Uh, and so you're going to see municipalities and states and even the federal government today, as I saw earlier with the uh, Veterans Department, you're going to start to see a, a real push to have people who aren't vaccinated start to get vaccinated. Joe, we don't even have 50 percent of the country completely mm -hmm. vaccinated yet. Right, exactly. I'm curious, on a bigger picture, Jeremy, you, you say that uh, we've heard all about education. There's no such thing as a stupid question, but I get the impression that kids now are quiet. As you said, they're reserved. They're being antisocial. They're not quite sure. For a lot of reasons, they're afraid to ask a question now because they're going to either appear uninformed or it's just sort of a mess out there. Exactly. And, you know, the point of my book, Hollowed Out, was that there were huge problems with our students before. Um, you know, our students before the pandemic were spending nine or 10 hours a day on their devices. And what does right. that mean? Here? That means they're not reading books. They're not dating. They're not going to football games. They're, they're not going to the movies. Uh, and, and when that happened, you see a lot of, you know, before the students even had to go on this lockdown, uh, you saw that they were being hollowed out through this crisis, I would say, in mental health. Mm -hmm. All of your teachers out there today, when I use this term right now, they're going to shake their head because they're going to know what I'm talking about. And that word is anxiety. Sure. Young people today are constantly talking about anxiety. Uh, mental health is in decline in this country with young people from sure. 2007 to 2017 the rate of depression went up uh, to 63 percent suicide has increased uh from 10 to 25 year olds in the last 10 years uh and, and again those numbers are before that's before right. the pandemic and we all know that young right. people need connections uh, they need to be talking they need friends this is the loneliest mm. generation in american history one out of five millennials say they don't have a friend in the entire world Half of 18 to 35 year olds don't have a romantic partner. They truly are being hollowed out, yeah. and this is making it all worse. Well, now I know why you wrote a book about it. It's been a fascinating yeah. conversation. Jeremy Adams, high school and college civics teacher and author of Hollowed Out, a warning about America's next generation. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you, Joe. Protesters took to the streets outside the White House in support of the Cuban people, but is the administration doing enough? A live report on that ahead. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Thousands of Cuban Americans gathering in Washington today, calling for freedom for the island and for the Biden administration to do more, gathering to mark the July 26th national holiday in Cuba. Demonstrators joined by politicians, including Florida Republican Senator Rick Scott, who has supported the calls for freedom. News Nation's Brian Enton joins us now live from Miami with the latest on the ongoing protests and demonstrations there. Brian? Yeah, Joe, the protests really just have not stopped for several weeks here in Miami. Take a look, all these Cuban Americans out on the streets again in Little Havana. But if you think this crowd is big, in D.C., it was just absolutely massive uh, today. Thousands and thousands of Cuban Americans from all over the country, they got on buses, 
They drove to D.C. They arrived this morning. They not only went to the White House, but they also uh, went to the Cuban embassy and right to the Capitol, pleading, they say, with President Biden for military intervention. I want to bring in Janet Hoffman here. You're from Cuba. You've lived in the U.S. for 31 years. You were telling me, what does military intervention mean to you and why do you want it? Okay. What military intervention mean to me, it's uh, help. We need to, uh, we want military intervention because it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean like uh, U.S. military going to drop a bomb. No, because with the technology, you know, our forces, they have the ability to help Cuba quickly. Thank you so much, Janet. I appreciate your time. Many of the people just like Janet telling me the same thing. This isn't for them about dropping bombs, Joe. Uh, what they say is that they believe the U.S. could go in 72 hours, get rid of the regime, uh, and there could finally be a democracy in Cuba. Joe? Brian, there was an item that we saw today that caught our eye, and I'm sure this didn't go unnoticed there at that demonstration, the fact that Russia has sent in some 88 tons of aid to Cuba. Yeah, two massive Antonov cargo Russian jets landed there over the weekend. The Russian government says they were full of aid, medical masks, and food. Uh, but if you talk to people here about it, uh, they have a lot of questions about that. We're going to have more on that coming up in the next hour. All right, Brian, thank you very much, Live Force Tonight in Miami. Those Cuban protesters are joining others for some politicking in Washington this week, namely the Texas state lawmakers who hopped on a private jet to stop a vote on election reform. Since then, at least six have tested positive for COVID, but uh, that's not why Democratic State Senator Eddie Lucio says he's staying put. He joins us now from Brownsville with an interesting story. Senator, you wrote about this. Uh, why are you not with that delegation in D.C.? Well, uh, there's several reasons. Thank you for having me on your show. Um, House Democrats are, uh, are already blocking the bill by breaking quorum. Um, as long as they stay in D.C., the bill obviously will not pass. Uh, until the session runs out, of course. Since the bill isn't passing anyway, some of my Senate colleagues decided it would be best to stay behind and draw attention, additional attention to the bill by asking questions of the bill's author and spotlighting some of the harmful provisions we heard about in committee. Uh, remaining, in, uh, remaining also to provide input uh, will help to moderate the bill. Mm -hmm. When only the majority party works on an issue, uh, the result is often extreme bills which do not serve the interests of, of Texans. So well, I, I do want to say that when I went into the Senate back in 1991, uh, there were 30, 31 senators in Texas, uh, 23 were Democrats, eight were Republicans back then. Right. Um, Another reason that actually, another, in other words, I want to say things have changed. Right. Well, um, you did this in 2003. I, I, you left town yeah. to, to avoid a vote, I which did. is why we wanted to talk to you about this. We've talked with a couple of your colleagues from the House side. Let's listen to what they said, and we'll, we'll ask you about it after. Sure. Both sides use it. These are tools in the bucket. It's only been used five times in the history of the state of Texas. So this isn't something that happens all the time. What we're trying to do now is certainly focus not just on the voting rights of people in Texas, but we've begun a national conversation of voting rights that are being trying to strip away in multiple states. So they're making the same argument you probably didn't know three, Senator. You say the circumstances are different now. Why? Well, no, the, the circumstances are different because back then it was uh, we were trying to save uh, congressional Democrats from losing their seats. 11 of us went. It was a narrow margin. Just, you know, quite frankly, there was only 11. With one breaking quorum, it was over. Right. Um, it's different now because there's more Democrats uh, in the House that went along on the trip that actually didn't have to go. But, but it's their choice, obviously. Another reason why I stayed behind is I had Senate Bill 4 on the floor that I was uh, authoring. Uh, and right. Governor Abbott put that bill on there, which is was very important to me. Does this pass inevitably, Senator? Uh, yes, I think it will. And, and the reason I say that is because um, when Governor Abbott um, went, took out Article 10 from the budget, uh, he vetoed that that article. It also with that with that move, um, I don't know if he was planning it that way or it just mm -hmm. happened. The 13th check for retired teachers went along with that, and now we have to put it back as the legislature. Um, so we have 
to have both both chambers uh, um, take that action. Another another reason is um, employee payroll. Uh, without both the House and Senate in in um, in session, uh, we and we don't put that in there, they don't get paid. So right. it's it's a, it's a critical point. All right, Texas Democratic State Senator Eddie Lucio Jr. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Also, Team USA suffers its first Olympic loss in the last 25 matches. Not the way the team wanted to kick off the games. Is the era of U.S. dominance in basketball over? Maybe they could use some help from this guy. Team, Team USA. Is Mike on that? Yeah. Off to a rocky start at the Tokyo Games. And we wondered how these Olympics would go over. And so far, it appears we are... Underwhelmed. No fans in the stands. We know that. An eerie quiet to the coverage. Viewership was way down for the opening ceremony. And then there was the USA basketball team of the weekend, loaded with NBA stars. They faltered down the stretch of the opening game, lost to France, their first Olympic loss since 2004. But counting exhibition games, they've lost three of their last five. Still alive, no doubt, but the road to gold just likely got a lot tougher. And many are wondering if the rest of the basketball world is catching up to us or if this was just an anomaly. We'll see. Which made this video, though, even more interesting, and some might say a little creepy. A robot playing basketball stole the show during that USA game against France. At halftime, the towering six foot ten robot was sinking half-court shots and three-pointers and free throws as well. The robot named Q. It's a project Toyota engineers dreamed up in their spare time just for grins. The third version of Q set the record, actually, for the most consecutive free throws by a humanoid robot a couple of years ago, 2,020 consecutive free throws. That was in honor of the 2020 game, so I'm assuming he could have kept going. We're not sure what kind of defense he plays, but the U.S. could have certainly used him over the weekend. That's our time for now. On Balance with Leland Vitter, next.